Hello, buonasera, buonasera. Uh, come sapete questo evento sarà in inglese, quindi adesso uh, switch in inglese e uh, facciamo tutto l'evento in inglese. Um, good evening everyone, uh, thank you for being here on uh, what in Rome is a very cloudy and uh, rainy uh, Friday night, but it's a pleasure to see you all and um, most of the faces that I'm seeing, I had the pleasure to see in person uh, a couple of weeks ago in Rome for the residential part of the, the Gasperi uh, training school. Um, so as you know, um, the event of today is part of the uh, project that the, the Gasperi Foundation is conducting in coordination with uh, NATO, uh, which is Young Voices Against Disinformation Building Resilience. It's been almost uh, um, eight months that we are conducting projects with NATO on uh, disinformation, and um, we had the possibility to reach out to more than uh, uh, 500 uh, young Italian and European students in order to raise awareness about the threat caused by disinformation and fake news. Um, but also to help them develop the right skills to actually play a part in countering this phenomenon. And uh, we were happy to see that there was a great interest uh, on these, and uh, we are happy again uh, to uh, to be here for the for what is the last event of uh, this uh, this project, the last event, but not the last activities, because we will involve uh, some of the people who participated in the uh, the Gasperi uh, school, the Gasperi training school, um, into writing a policy paper. Um, to analyze what the problem is and uh, and to suggest some policies that NATO could uh, put in place to involve young people more into uh, what they do to counter disinformation and fake news. Uh, so with us today, um, we have Larissa Laco, which is the counter hostile information and disinformation officer at uh, NATO. Uh, thank you, Larissa, for being with us. Um, and we also have Lucas Andriukaitis, um, Associate Director, Digital Forensic Research Lab of the Atlantic Council and co-founder of the Civic Resilience Initiative, a very good friend of the, the Gasperi Foundation and also the Civic Resilience, Resilience Initiative is a very good partner of ours and we are very proud to have them uh, on board. Um, guys, first of all, uh, Thank you very much for being here. Um, let me explain how the event will work. Uh, so the structure will be uh, the usual. We'll have an introductory um, introduction remarks from uh, both our speakers. And then we will open the floor to questions. Um, I'll please invite you to write your questions or uh, say that you want to ask a question on the chat. Uh, and then I'll give you the floor or if you don't feel uh, like asking the question, you can also write the question on the chat and I will read out to our speak. I will read it out to our speakers myself. Uh, if you don't have question, I will have a lot of question of my own because I'm definitely very interested on this topic. So without further ado, we're gonna start with Larissa Lack, who is gonna give us a perspective about what NATO is doing to counter this information. Over to you, Larissa. Thank you, Mattia, and uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to, uh, to chat with you guys. Um, of course, at NATO, we really believe in the importance of building resilience against disinformation. So, of course, that starts with educating people about the threat. So really happy that uh, I'm here and I get to talk to everyone about it today and really support the work that you do. Um, so to dive in, um, first, I'll talk a little bit about the environment that NATO finds itself in today and the nature of the threat. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing to deal with disinformation. And so, of course, NATO is a political and military alliance, and its purpose is to guarantee the freedom and security of its members through political and military means. And NATO's core tasks are collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. And these tasks are, are as important as ever. NATO's mission is about protecting its almost 1 billion citizens. Uh, it's about preserving peace and defending the Euro-Atlantic area. And so today, NATO allies, of course, face a wide range of security threats, including what we call hybrid threats. And one of the most 
Common and effective hybrid tools, of course, is disinformation and other forms of information manipulation, which we at NATO like to call hostile information activities. And so this is a term that we use to describe activities that aim to influence specific audiences through either propaganda, disinformation, or a combination of these sorts of activities. And of course, this is a corrosive threat. Um, hostile information activities are capable of eroding confidence in government and democratic institutions. Um, they're capable of sowing discord among uh, society members. And this, of course, can continue on over the long term if it's not addressed. Um, our alliance, of course, is founded on democratic values, and it's therefore one of these institutions that is under a constant uh, barrage. And what is most concerning is that we've seen how these activities are able to provoke real world action and real world harm. And so protecting citizens from these threats is a national security prerogative. And that's why NATO and allies have an essential role to play. So allies have been dealing with uh, this threat for a number of years. Um, it's not a new phenomenon, um, but as you all know, with the advancement of technology uh, and the changed information ecosystem, this has changed the speed, the scale, and the sophistication of these hostile information activities. And of course, these activities have also become part of uh, geopolitical strategies of certain actors in order to achieve strategic gains. And this has been recognized by allies. So in the Brussels Summit communique of this year, allies did articulate um, their commitment to combat hybrid threats, including disinformation. So to address this challenge, NATO's approach to countering disinformation involves a twin track model focused on two functions, on the one hand, understand, and on the other hand, engage. And so the understand function encompasses monitoring and analyzing the information environment uh, and information that is relevant to NATO's mission. And then the engage function embeds these insights, allowing NATO to tailor its communications um, where it will most effectively counter disinformation. And so when we talk about the understand function, uh, there's a colleague of mine that likes to say, uh, you can't defend what you can't define. Um, and that's a pretty good saying, I think, because we can't defend against threats from hostile actors if we can't first identify them and understand them. So comprehensively understanding the information environment is crucial in order to enable a credible response. And so we, we monitor, monitor the information environment regularly um, and we try to glean actionable insights and recommendations and, and use that to inform our communications and those of our allies. Um, so when it comes to the engage function, um, of course, we communicate proactively on a wide range of channels. And our policy is that we think that fact-based, proactive, and evidence-based communications are the best way of countering disinformation. And this is, of course, based on the alliances core values of democracy, freedom of speech, and rule of law. And NATO continues to expose disinformation through a wide range of media engagements, including statements and rebuttals, corrections, and briefings, in order to inform a wide range of audiences about disinformation and propaganda. But we have to remember that if we don't fill the void of information, somebody else will, and with their own twist. So it's not just about debunking, but of course, sometimes it's best to ignore uh, and a lot of the effort should be focused on proactive communications uh, and it should be focused on your own story. So perhaps some of you have heard about the We Are NATO campaign that we're, that we're running. Um, you know, that's one of the examples of proactive communications that we have, um, but it's always about getting your story out there first. Um, and in, in addition to proactive communications, um, a lot of the, the efforts focus on building resilience as well. Um, and you know, adopting that whole of society approach. So NATO supports allied initiatives at local levels that aim to do exactly that. Um, this includes investing in media literacy, um, investing in research on disinformation and, uh, and those types of initiatives. Um, and then sort of the most important, I think one of the most important things that underpin uh, all of our work is of course coordination, uh, which is the cornerstone of our work. And um, this includes, um, you know, NATO's work with other inter international organizations, such as the European Union. Uh, so we work quite closely with the European External Action Service, um, with the G7 Rapid Response Mechanism, with the U.S. State Department's Global Engagement Center. 
And we also work uh, quite closely with uh, civil society organizations as well. Um, so NATO's active cooperation with partners globally strengthens our collective ability to address the challenge of disinformation. And the value that NATO brings to the space is that it provides a platform for discussion, for consultation and coordination, to be able to share best practices and to coordinate action. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, um, but really excited to take part in the discussion. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Larissa. And thank you especially for being so precise with the timing. And uh, I got already a bunch of questions for you, but we're going to wait for that. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Lucas, who is going to is going to take us a little bit. Uh, in, I mean, it's going to let us dive in a little bit more into the specifics of this. And uh, Lucas, over to you. Thank you very much. I hope you can see my screen. Um, as always, talking about this info, I like to keep it very visual uh, because uh, I think it's, it's way better to understand what we're dealing with. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can. I was just, I was just wondering, like, what is your meme? What are your memes? Ah, uh, sorry, I don't have a whole lot today, <laughs> but... Um, I'll, I promise to send it to the group after. <laughs> Please do. Um, anyway, so my name is Lukas Andrukaitis. I work with the DFR Lab. I'm not sure how many of you uh, had the chance to, to, to hear about us, to know what we do. Uh, but basically, we're part of the Atlantic Council uh, of a far larger think tank. I would say one of the biggest think tanks in, in the United States. And this is just a map of our, of our spread in the world which I always like to say that is, I think, the best, the best and the biggest sort of advantage that the uh, DFR Lab has, because we have people in various parts of the world uh, working uh, on those issues there. And usually those are the people from, from there, right? So for example, uh, I'm working on Russia a whole lot. So most of the examples I'm going to provide you today are going to be Russian. And uh, I, I I grew up in Lithuania on the border with Russia, so I do have a good understanding on, on how they operate. The same goes with uh, you know Latin America, West Africa, and whatnot, and whatnot. But uh, I think the main the main thing about the FR Lab, uh, the main uh, thing that separates us from from everything else, uh, is that we deal with open source data, and we have this motto of uh, identifying, exposing, uh, exposing, and explaining this information using open source data. Um, I'm not going to go a whole lot into what is open source data. It's, it's quite a broad uh, description and different organizations have, uh, have slightly different descriptions of it. Uh, but basically, uh, anything that comes from the internet without breaking the law, it can be, uh, it can be said that it's open source. And if you use some of the tools and methods to sort of uh, easier search, uh, you might, you might at the end of the day, have a pretty good, um, well, a pretty good uh, tool to battle this information. So uh, today I was asked to talk a bit more uh, about how uh, various countries uh, use this information uh, and how we can approach to, to fight it. So um, my, my idea today is to give you some, some of the main um, approaches that countries like Russia, China, and other authoritarian leaning countries tend to use uh, to forward their information goals. And um, definitely this is not a 20 minute topic that I was given today. So uh, excuse me for running through everything uh, quite fast, but I hope you'll have any, you know, I'll, I'll be able to answer anything that uh, you might be interested in during the Q and A. So without further ado, um, one of the tools that we mostly use to battle this info are these uh, social media listening tools that you can see on the screen. There is a, a whole plethora of different tools uh, out there. Uh, the FR Lab, we prefer these three. Um, and the idea behind them is that they are helping us to minimize the uh, what we're looking at uh, on social media, right? So using specific keywords, hashtags, uh, combinations of keywords or, or images or anything like that, so we're able to um, filter what we want to see and uh, then analyze that information. This can be, of course, done without social media listening tools, but it's uh, it's a process that takes a lot of time, right? So 
this just helps to speed up the process. And uh, the best part is that everyone uh, has access to it. And if you would follow along the same steps, you'll get the same results. Um, so what's, what can we learn from uh, bigger countries like uh, Russia or China? Um, um, I'll start with, with number one. Uh, they, they have good approaches into dominating information space. And uh, this is especially true in, um, in uh, regional, maybe a bit more regional countries that uh, have less of, of uh, strong you know, journalistic, uh, journalistic communities. So for example, uh, this, this one comes from Syria, from the MENA region, but we see the same in Libya. For a long time, we've seen we saw the same in Ukraine before things have, have started to change. Basically, by using open source tools, we're able to see which of the media outlets are the most engaging, well, produce the most engaging uh, content. So, uh, if we would go back to 2018, 2019, uh, and type in Free Syrian Army, uh, which was the opposition to Assad fighting in Syria. We would see uh, that um, the most uh, sort of engaged with uh, material was coming from uh, very specific uh, media outlets, right? So Arabic RT, for example, which uh, on Facebook was dominating sham.org, uh, which was a pro pro uh, uh, pro Assad uh, sort of media outlet, and uh, on the rebel side, it was only number three, right? So. If we take the whole narrative if, uh, about who's forming the, the free Syrian army uh, in Arabic and, and actually in English, which is my uh, next slide, we can see that uh, it's very specific outlets managed to occupy uh, and, and make, well, make people believe that they are the ones uh, who, have, who have the answers about, uh, about any given issue and this, in case free Syrian army, right? We can see South France, uh, Al Mazdar News, Sputnik News, like uh, TRT World, and, and, and so on, so on. So a lot of um, a lot of um, very biased sort of media outlets manage manage to do that. Um, what else? Uh, in in Russian speaking world, we also see that uh, they're able to create these sort of uh, semi think tanks, fake think, think tanks, like in this case, Fond Strategische Kultury. Uh, which uh, a lot of it has been taken down uh, during one of the Facebook takedowns. And we had a chance to uh, investigate how they operate. So this is, again, one of those supposed to be think tanks that are paid by Kremlin and operate uh, in Russia, uh, spreading all sorts of disinfo. And uh, Facebook took it down because they actually uh, noticed that there's inauthentic, uh, inauthentic behavior happening, uh, coordinated behavior, and uh, gave us a chance to take a deeper look. So I'm not going to go into all of these different um, narratives that they spread. Uh, a lot of it is here. You can see a lot of it is against Baltic countries. Again, uh, the, the last one is about uh, United States of America. Uh, anything you can think of um, calling everyone uh, aggressive, uh, Russophobic, um, you know, all the classic Russian stuff. But the way they managed to uh, sort of manipulate the traffic online is, is quite spectacular. So uh, by using these uh, social media listening tools, one thing we are able to do is to do social mapping. And a lot of organizations do that as well. Uh, basically, we are able to take a snapshot of any given timeline and uh, sort of create these uh, social network maps, roadmaps, and see which are the key uh, um, accounts or key groups that are dominating uh, any given uh, uh, any given information space. So in this case, we're, we were able to see who are the most engaged with and who are the most active accounts that are spreading uh, the news produced by Fond Strategische Kultur. And uh, these uh, orange dots are the key accounts that we're the most interested in, right? Once we identify who are behind, who are sort of uh, behind the, the the puppet masters, if I may say, then we're able to zoom in and analyze them even more. And this is where the fun part is. And uh, especially if they're doing a pretty lousy job, we are able to uh, see that, for example, Eva Merkuryeva and Marina Tsukanova, which were uh, two allegedly uh, different people, one from, I think, Ukraine and one from Belarus, uh, you start seeing that they're using images of the same person, right? Uh, it's exactly the same, per exactly the same person uh, with a little bit of filter and a little bit of dog <laughs> you know, the other photo. But uh, we managed to see that basically all of those orange dots, uh, which were the key 
key accounts were with the same uh, person's photos or with the dog's photos, like Fiona Armani that you see on the left had the dog that was in Eva Mercuria was uh, photo, uh, photo dump in, in her account, right? So this is pretty sloppy and it's quite easy to sort of connect the dots and see that even if that's not the same person whose photos we're seeing, most likely it's coordinated. Someone just took someone's photos and made a bunch of key accounts that were highly active and pretending to be something, someone else. Now, uh, the, other, uh, the other thing that they're very good at is using trolls and this is quite problematic. Um, this this will be related uh, a little bit related with Siri as well. Uh, back in 2018, uh, but uh, it it still goes on. Uh, they're able to use trolls to attack uh, specific individuals, right? So, for example, uh, the Guardian political editor Heather Stewart uh, once uh, she criticized uh, Assad's regime, so she sort of uh, received these spikes in her activity. Uh, trolls organize, uh, organized approaches were, were uh, sort of targeting her to, to write uh, offensive messages. Uh, they would uh, add additional handles to, to make uh, the messages go, go further. And in this case, Carmen uh, Renieri, which was the sort of the key individual in this, in this uh, troll attack, uh, when, once we analyzed her initial tweets, we started seeing that uh, we started seeing uh, the whole network on, on who is then uh, retweeting her posts, right? And uh, once we identify these, again, key individuals, we start to see that there are quite a few well-known Russian trolls like Malinka1102 or at uh, Two Flames Burning One, which uh, might be taken down at this point, but uh, a year or so back were still very highly active. So uh, uh, those accounts then again are sort of uh, adding adding their own original messages to to the whole situation. But uh, this initial layout of how they started and who joins and, and so on and so on can be achieved using uh, social media listening tools. The same we saw uh, with the United States uh, official uh, Twitter accounts, the uh, U.S. Department of State, um, sorry, the Depart Department of Defense. Uh, once the uh, mil uh, military strikes happened in Syria, if you remember, uh, uh, once the alleged, well, not alleged, actual chemical weapon used was, was, was uh, used by Assad, when that happened, the uh, U.S. responded with military strikes, and in, in return, they, they received these troll attacks on, uh, and as they said, they, they, um, the, the use of their handle increased 2000%. So they noticed the, uh, the, the troll activity increased 2000% in one day, which is very, very significant. And then we, we can see things that we call um, sort of uh, hashtag flooding, right? So uh, these fake hashtags like uh, hashtag Syria strikes start being used and uh, trolls and, 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 and bot accounts are being uh, uh, thrown on top of it to to make it trending and uh, and uh, to to make these troll attacks more and more uh, believable and more uh, more active, right? And uh, once you take a deeper look, then you can see that uh, a bunch of these accounts were retweeting or or using that the handle uh, are like this, like Hillary Fairly Bay, right? Uh, a clear a clear bot accounts, which on the right side um, of the screen you can see that uh, uh, he was, you know. Not even involved at, at the beginning with with anything related with that, but when the time came, he was turned on to to be attacking uh, uh, State Department, right? So um, this is a very well known tactic. The same we saw around the same time in Britain as well. Uh, hashtag not in my name, Theresa May. Uh, this is slightly more interesting because it shows the complexity how it, uh, these troll attacks can be attached to actual events that are happening, right? So very uh, proactive uh, sort of approaches. So Rachel of Swindon was an actual, I'm not sure if she's now, but at that time she was the labor, uh, one of the labor MPs. And she published this uh, actual poll uh, asking if, if Teresa's, Teresa May's sort of uh, politics regarding Syria were, were supported. And a ton of, uh, a ton of Twitter users asked, answered no, but our colleague Ben Nemo actually took a deeper look. And uh, once we sort of map it out using social media listening tools, we can start again seeing some of the Russian trolls who are very, very active in spreading the message, right? So we can see how they latched on an actual, uh, actual political, uh, political 
uh, process. And, Lucas, um, Lucas, I'm gonna yeah. stop, I'm gonna stop you one second because yes. we have we have a question, and if you yeah. and it's like, what is so, the definition of troll in this context? So if you could just like give a in yeah. a snapshot. Of course, um, um, a troll. Uh, we would define it as a account, um, most likely that is pretending to be someone else, who has the the main uh, goal uh, to provoke. Uh, using manipulating uh, social media algorithms uh, using you know uh, unorthodox sort of a, a social media activity to provoke cause uh, uh, cause chaos and and things like that so it, most of them as i mentioned are pretending to be someone else uh, not real accounts uh, but the goal is to to cause chaos and reach for some some goals on online if that makes sense um, Thanks. Fantastic. You you go. Yeah. No worries. Uh, no worries. Uh, so the third one is using propaganda and fringe outlets. Uh, we see that everywhere. Uh, again, this as, as I've been researching Syria for years, I have a lot of good experience, uh, sort of examples from Syria. But uh, the way they usually do it is, is like this. Uh, an independent Syria outlet, Derazor 24, a very regional, uh, like, I don't want to say fringe outlet, but the very regional small outlets have posted that uh, U.S. forces are rescuing uh, ISIS commanders without providing any proof, and uh, this was picked up by bot activity, and we see that all the time, right? So what happens is that uh, they take something that was published not by not by Russian or Chinese or any other authoritarian countries' propaganda outlets, and then amplified really really badly using these uh, fringe or actually pro-Kremlin sources like Sputnik, South France, uh, and so on, so on. So basically they latch on what is happening and just spread a very favorable story, right? And uh, sometimes the engagements are not, not really uh, significant. Sometimes they are, they are right? So 5,000 Facebook engagements, maybe not life-changing, but at least 5,000 people believed or engaged with, with that story. The same we saw about white helmets. Uh, NGO that was sort of pretend trying to to rescue uh, people that uh, that were in, in burning buildings uh, or or rescue them from the rubble. Uh, we saw that exactly the same thing, right? RT published that uh, white helmets are, are had uh, one of one of the attacks uh, were instigated by them. RT published it, and again, a lot of these fringe uh, media outlets latched on, and we can see some of the coordination by. Uh, how soon a, in each after uh, each after sort of uh, republish the same story, right? So we can sort of expand and see how how the message how the message spreads, and then again uh, measure the, the effectiveness on, on that story in a given moment. And another one is buying disinformation networks. Uh, this might I don't know if 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 you haven't been uh, exposed to it, a lot of people get surprised by it, but uh, these. Uh, these countries are very good with actually using money to uh, to receive uh, to receive fake activity online. So this is Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I'm not sure how many of you followed it, but basically, when Armenia and Azerbaijan was uh, fighting each other on the ground, they were also fighting each other online. And what we started seeing uh, were a lot of pro-Armenian and uh, pro-Azeri uh, hashtags, and we well, started collecting them uh, and. Uh, in this research, I got more or less 10 on one side and 10 on the other, which were the most engaged with and measured uh, who's winning this online fight, right? So what we can see is that uh, pro-Armenian uh, hashtags received uh, half of the engagements that the pro-Azerbaijani uh, received. So they were, uh, so to say, winning the online fight. And if you can see these uh, very sharp spikes, increases in specific days, uh, this is something that uh, we always keep an eye on because this is one of the, the best ways to notice that uh, uh, some in, inauthentic activity is happening, right? So that someone created the hashtag, started uh, sharing it really quickly, and then it died down because of the, uh, well, because no one actually, uh, or, or sort of latched on it naturally, right? So when we started looking at one by one, we see that, again, like in very short period of time between October 15 and 19th, we have a, a spike and it dies down, right? So clearly inauthentic behavior. So what we do again, 
we scrape all this data, make a snapshot, uh, try to investigate the main groups that are happening and try to identify how these groups fit together, who, who are behind them, right? So the main effort, effort you see here was quite complex to analyze because uh, there were a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of different groups. So a, a lot of governmental accounts, a lot of um, people living in the United States, so Azerbaijani people living in the United States who are oftentimes very nationalistic, patriotic and so on, trying to defend you know, the, the narratives of their country. But what is interesting, uh, what was the most interesting were those three communities that we saw on, on the right side. And according to our, our analysis, they were bought. Uh, oh, this is just a quick snapshot how if, if we zoom out and leave just 0.27% of total accounts, we can see actually the most engaged with accounts. And uh, from this, you can get this, right? So sort of a, a clear zoom into this view. Uh, so. The first and second of those communities were less interesting. They were classic bot, uh, bot, bot nets, uh, because they were dealing with, you know, uh, they were actually most of them were Turkish, and they were all dealing with, uh, I don't know, I don't know, like uh, talking about music, talking about movies and culture and and, and whatnot. And then suddenly, for two days, they switched into going Armenia is killing people. Armenia is responsible for the war and then switching back to doing whatever they did. But the third community was the most interesting because all of them were um, Turkish and all of them, the main thing that related all of them were that they were into K-pop culture. Korean pop music was something that they spoke about for months and months and months nonstop, tens and twelves of uh, tweets per day. And then for two days, they talked about how, how Armenia is horrible in Armenian or other languages and then switch back to K-pop, right? So clearly, uh, clearly that's something was when they were paid to do that, they switched back once the payment was over. But yeah, how much time do I have? Maybe I should stop. Um, well, I, I think it would be a good note where to stop because like who doesn't love K-pop? And, um, and I think that this should lead to a study about, you know, the strategic use uh, of K-pop for geopolitical purposes. Um, no, but if you want to wrap it up in uh, like two minutes. Um, All right. That'd be great because we we we're still good with uh, six uh, thirty two. Cool. So cool. Um, so just to wrap up, I'm going to show uh, a few examples that we learned from the Belarus migrant crisis, which you might have heard about, which presented some very interesting uh, which is uh, trends as well. I'm sorry, it's fantastic yeah. because like one of the question is, and this is also like how we're going to introduce the Q&A and, and go back to Larissa then, uh, because one of the questions asked by Giovanni is uh, regarding the massive disinformation propaganda spread by Lukashenko regime concerning the migrant crisis and uh, at the Polish and Lithuanian borders. And uh, Giovanni wanted to know also what NATO response to this disinformation activity has been. So I think we start with this uh, wrap up with Lucas and then we'll go to Larissa to yeah. understand better what NATO has been doing about this. Perfect. So just very quickly, three main things that we've seen that we usually don't see uh, in other uh, instances was that Belarus, Belarus, Belarusians and Russians were using reverse narratives. So state border committee, uh, committee for uh, Republic of Belarus has been very active in, in, in doing that. So they created uh, on, their, on their social media accounts. Uh, we saw a bunch of these narratives uh, targeting Latvia, Lithuania and Poland being, being used. And once we started putting numbers together uh, to see who are, um, republishing these narratives that you see on the bottom. I'm not going to go into those, but uh, we noticed that Russian uh, re sources republishing it were even more active than Belarusian sources. So we can see how a third country sort of steps in into promoting uh, these fake narratives uh, clearly with, with their own interests, right? Uh, the second one was creation or facilitation of Arabic language groups. It's really hard to prove that they were created by Belarus. Uh, because no one really knows, but what we saw were a lot of clearly Belarusian actors involved in those in those groups, providing information, providing uh, tips and tricks how to and where to best uh, you know breach breach the borders where the where the patrols are and so on and so on. And uh, this this we saw. We don't know if they were created by them, but we we saw that they were very active in sharing this uh, actual information.
shocking to um, uh, sorry, this was shocking to to most of us. Is that uh, the Lucas? Something happened with the audio. I think. The Oops. Sorry. I'm not sure if you can. Tourist, tourist sort of groups and 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 so on, uh, creating these advertisements campaigns in Arabic language in targeting Syria, Iraq, and other countries. So, and even uh, you know, accounts have, as you can see here, like Yevgeny, uh, who was uh, one of the tour tour uh, companies, sort of. Uh, uh, workers, he was answering in Arabic, answering questions, uh, selling his uh, uh, his flights to and visas uh, to the country in, in Arabic, which again shows shows the involvement in the information space. So on this note, uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it up for Q and A, uh, and let Larissa uh, answer the other question. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Lucas. And yes, we go. Um, I'm sorry for hijacking a little bit of uh, your presentation, Lucas, but like if you can make this more interactive is, is always the better, I think. Um, so well, talking about mm, the, the recent migration, uh, sorry, yeah, the recent migration crisis uh, at the borders between uh, between Poland and, and Lithuania, but also, if I may, um, uh, Staying on the on the eastern flank, uh, Larissa, like the, the recent events, the reasons, the recent movement of troops, uh, Russian troops at the border, um, that has that has been also accompanied by this information campaign. What NATO has been doing, and what what is NATO approach in general to to this kind of uh, offensive, this information offensive? Thanks, Mutia. Thanks for the question. So. Um... I mean, I guess the, speaking generally about about the instrumentalization of migrants by Belarus, but also the situation um, on the Ukrainian border with Russia. I think the first thing is always enhancing situational awareness, um, and of course, this means tracking statements of uh, key leaders. This means monitoring um, media outlets. This means looking at what's happening on social media. And that kind of information needs to be shared with allies so that they are up to speed on what the information environment actually looks like. And that's really important because these types of insights contribute to an overall picture. You know, when we talk about hybrid activities, it's cross domain, it's many different, um, many different domains. So it's about making sure that insights from the information environment actually contribute to that broader picture. Um, you know, in the context of Belarus, um, one of the things that NATO did was that it issued a strong statement, and this was issued in November. So this was a statement that all allies um, agreed to at the NAC, and it essentially condemned the activities of Belarus um, and the way that it was, um, the activities that it was basically carrying out on NATO's uh, eastern flank. And oftentimes, you know, it's people think, oh, it's just sound, it's just a statement. But I mean, it's a powerful statement because here you have 30 allies that um, that have made an agreement to say something publicly, um, you know, against uh, against a, a hostile actor. Um, so in a nutshell, that was uh, that was sort of NATO's response. So I would say enhancing situational awareness and then, um, you know, having a collective public statements. Thank you, Larissa. Um, and well, taking it from, from here, um, and before going into another question that some of, um, some of the, um, somebody in our, in our audience uh, was asking, um, like, It seems to me that actors over time have become a little bit more sophisticated uh, in conducting these information activities. Um, how so, and uh, and how do we uh, how do we keep the pace of these to counter them? Maybe we go first to Lucas and then to to Larissa. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to make it quick. Um, in practice, yes, they are becoming more sophisticated and they are raising more and more problems uh, for uh, you know fact checkers and, and debunkers like us. 
at the same time, to make it sophisticated, you have to invest more money and time. Uh, so there's still a bunch of groups and, uh, and networks that are pretty scrappily made and like pretty easy to debunk and sell. But for those who, for those goals that they want to actually achieve, uh, they invest more. And uh, I don't know, maybe a good example would be uh, Operation Infection uh, that the FR Lab has reported on. Uh, you can Google it and actually find it, which was like a multi-year uh, with uh, operation with very clear uh, OPSEC, so operational security. Uh, they were doing very everything very carefully. Uh, the question is how much they achieved, but uh, to track them took us a few years. So uh, they are becoming more uh, more and more smart about it. And with such developments as AI, I see a lot of future future challenges, uh, well, even more and more. So uh, in reality, in reality, I think we will have more problems in the future. Thank you, Lucas. Well, this is good for you. It's good for the business, I guess. <laughs> Larissa. Um, I'd say that one of the things that we've been noticing in the last few months, and this is something that has also been captured by the platforms, is this shift um, to the French platforms and also the use of websites that hostile actors are using. Um, and that's an important part of the supply chain of today's disinformation. So sort of the, the cross-cutting efforts that have been taken by researchers, by governments, by platforms um, to kind of expose the behaviors on you know, Twitter and Facebook. This has driven some of the activity over to the French platforms and to websites and more obscure outlets where detection is a little bit less, um, where, where you know, it's, it's, it's harder to detect the activities of certain actors. And especially, you know, when you think about also um, the closed chat groups, for example, you know, how are we supposed to be able to monitor that? So I think that's, it's not necessarily becoming more sophisticated, I guess it's becoming more sneaky. Um, but that's one of the things that, you know, that we've sort of noticed this year. Um, and then maybe one more thing, um, something that we've noticed, uh, and this you know, this kind of came out when um, last year we were, uh, NATO was um, the target of a coordinated disinformation campaign. Um, I don't know if folks have heard about this fake letter, this fake section letter that, you know, said that NATO was going to withdraw troops from, uh, from Lithuania. Um, you know, there were a, a few examples like that where we see the cyber enabled um, information operations. So, you know, back in the day, I think the cyber enabled info ops, the hack and leaks, those would kind of grab media headlines, but now it seems to be something that's a lot more common, um, which is, you know, obviously makes, makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, so those are some of the, some of the trends that we've been seeing. And, uh, so many interesting in what you said now, um, like, first of all, what you were saying about the, um, it, it reminded me of the, what we, what I saw, uh, like personally working with uh, jihadist uh, extremism and far right extremism, uh, since the Europol started to crack down on Telegram and more uh, known um, messaging apps, there was a phenomenon called uh, the platforming. So uh, terrorists started to move on into more like fringe um, messaging apps and platform. And are you telling me that something similar is happening with this information and, uh, and that actors are moving into social media that are more like, let's say, fringe or um, less known that, than Facebook and, 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 and Twitter and, um, and Instagram and, and LinkedIn? I think, the, I think the goal there is um, if they move to those platforms that are a little bit more obscure, um, then real users can natively pull the content onto mainstream platforms themselves. And then it becomes a little bit more difficult in terms of taking that content down on Facebook or Twitter, because those are, you know, sort of real users sharing content. Um, and I think that's, that might be the, the goal there. It's very, very interesting. And, and the, other, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, to dig on a little bit more with you, uh, also because we have a question uh, that wants to understand what is the relation between this information and cybersecurity. And I wonder if you both could expand a little bit of that on that. And maybe we start with Larissa 
and uh, and then we go on with with Lucas. I think this was related to what uh, to one of the latest things that you were saying in your previous intervention. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not a cyber expert, <laughs> um, but I, I guess like an example is um, you know an actor um, compromising a website and then putting disinformation or other types of content on that website. Um, that's an example of a cyber, cyber enabled information operation or, um, you know, actors um, sending spoof emails to folks, um, you know, with disinformation, you know, in the, in the body of the, the email. So those are just some examples um, of what we mean when we say cyber enabled disinfo. Sorry, I was muted. Fantastic. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, Lucas, do you feel like adding something? Yeah, um, I think Larissa is completely right. Um, I'm definitely not a cyber expert myself, but we see a lot of different instances of, of um, hacking being part of disinfo campaigns. Um, for example, there was this Operation Ghost Rider in, in the Baltics uh, a few months back. And what he did, they did some prep work um they send out some phishing emails to some accounts some of them they hacked uh they managed to hack down one of the uh, uh, web servers which had like a bunch of smaller uh, sort of taking care of a bunch of smaller web pages and they coordinated everything they managed to get and they did a little uh this info campaign on um Tsikhanovskaya, which is the the leader of the protesters in belarus uh in lithuanian they've managed to sort of uh send send a message in in all of these uh hacked uh, um, web pages and then use all those hacked accounts on twitter and facebook to push as much as possible the message to create a precedent so that people would start talking about it so i i guess this is one of the best uses right so if you hack enough of of different uh, accounts and web pages you can make make seem that something is actually happening before uh, uh, before those pages are being taken down, but you create a precedent which looks like real, and then it sort of naturally uh, is being spread online until someone uh, notices and, and and starts taking it down. So I think this is one of the most common things we're seeing. But then the damage is done because, of course, the debunking activities is always uh, reactionary, uh, and so part of the damages cannot be cannot be controlled. Um, so. Actually, uh, I wanted to go, uh, so we spoke a lot about Russia uh, as an actor, um, but of course that is also like a problem of, a problem linked to the deniability of certain actions and the, the difficulty that we have in identifying who is behind certain certain actions. And, and talking about this, I, I, it'd be interesting to, to ask you guys like, Apart from Russia, like who else is there in terms of state actors? And uh, from your different perspective, uh, are there non-state actors that we should uh, watch out for? Uh, maybe we go Larissa first and, and then Lucas. Um, so, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I'll list like the different state actors that were Kind of tracking, but I, I think because I think that you know the the global threat stems for, from a variety, and the threat is bigger than any one country. Um, I mean, of course, we detect some disinformation more from some countries rather than others, um, and I, you know, but what we've been seeing, of course, you know, like whether it's Russia or whether it's China, the the goal is to destabilize and undermine Western societies and provide an alternate worldview. Uh, to undermine democratic values. Um, and there are, you know, maybe a number of actors that do that. Um, and when it comes to non-state actors, um, I mean, we did see a little bit of this during uh, COVID, um, non-state actors trying to exploit the pandemic. Um, so for example, terrorist groups trying to recruit new followers and mount attacks or to improve uh, their public image. Um, I know that there was a terror, I know that I think um, ISIS claimed uh, committing acts of terror makes jihadis immune to COVID. There were some, you know, narratives going around like yeah. that. Yeah, the, they um, called it for many, many months, the punishment uh, to the crusaders. So yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. No worries. 
Yeah. Um, like I in, any case, in any case, uh, Larissa, I'm not going to get you uh, get, get along with this very diplomatic answer because I want to, I'm going to ask you about China again. Uh, <laughs> but uh, first, Lucas, and then I'm going to go back to, to Larissa. Yeah, I, I actually think that Larissa actually uh, put everything very much uh, in the right place. And I don't have a whole lot to add. The, the three big bad guys are uh, China, Russia, and Iran own with their own little um, goals and their own little regions of interest. Uh, but when we're talking about um, non-state actors, I would also add to what Larissa was saying, uh, fringe politicians, uh, fringe political uh, movements, which I think we saw a whole lot during COVID, right? So those fringe politicians that wanted to ride on the COVID, uh, COVID train, uh, you know, all the you you can't you can't take our freedoms away this you know vaccination is the modification of genes whatever whatever uh and then uh yeah the, you know the usual suspects the far left and the far right who again uh, have their own uh their own agendas that they're trying to achieve and uh they're using a lot of the same tactics on usually on the lower scale uh, not all components are available for them for example they cannot use uh, governmental Twitter accounts like China or uh, Russia can, which is a uh, huge, uh, uh, or or other things, right? They don't have the resources or the know-how in, in many ways how to replicate what the big guys are doing, but uh, they're learning from them, and a lot are a lot of the methods are similar. Thank you, Lucas. Um, actually, uh, two questions. Uh, the first one would be like. And again, this is the perspective of somebody who is a little bit external. Like, of course, like I've been to in the past year, been looking into this information much more. And but from an, an external perspective, it seems that we talk a lot about this information from Russia, but somehow like we talk less about this information from China. Is this because we are looking less in that direction, or we are looking at it, but it's less threatening threatening at the moment? And, and therefore, we talk a little bit less about it. Maybe Lucas, then uh, Larissa. Um, I would say, like if we're talking specifically about China, Chinese uh, disinfo, I think it's just slightly different in nature. Um, it is um, less offensive than Russian or Belarusian. They're more reactive and uh, they're usually their goals, I mean, depending on, on the topic we're talking about, right? If we're talking about COVID, Chinese disinfo was way more defensive uh, and they were like trying to push more uh, fake narratives that are defending, saving their face, uh, saying that we're the cure and not the, the reason and so on, so on. If we're, but uh, the other thing is that uh, they, they react on specific things that hurt to them the most. A good example is when Lithuania opened the Taiwanese uh, representation, uh, they were really uh, have you know they went with the whole uh, propaganda machine from like uh, spokes spokesperson of China like politicians uh, foreign ministry uh, accounts and so on to fringe media outlets and so on. So whenever they, you touch on on a very you know sensitive topic, then they will attack you. But usually they're they're more lenient and and not as Russia who are just uh you know for every given given chance at attacking anyone who, who they can uh, so diff that's the difference russia is more opportunistic and aggressive china is more defensive and uh, uh yeah i think that's the main difference larissa so i think um you know from the nato perspective allies are still working better to understand the implications of china's increasingly assertive international policies um and of course, we are monitoring and we're observing. I think one of the things that we noticed during COVID is that communications from China did evolve to become more assertive. Um, and the objective seemed to be there to, you know, to publicly dismiss any criticism of China's response to the pandemic and to promote China as a responsible global leader. Um, but I think, you know, of course, historically, you know, NATO has mostly been looking at other actors <laughs> um but i think i think allies are now starting to starting to try to understand better what the implications are coming from china thank you larissa um 
I, I was going to say before, uh, after Lucas' comment, uh, you don't don't poke the bear, but in this case would be don't poke the dragon. Um, but uh, to move on, um, I have uh, two questions. One is going to be for, for Larissa, and the other one is going to be for the both of you. So the first one would be, um, Larissa, how does NATO help allies uh, and partners, but also maybe societies uh, in, in dealing with the threat of disinformation. And then for the both of you, um, we have been talking today quite a lot about uh, current and past trends in this information, but what are uh, the trends uh, of tomorrow that you are, uh, that you are observing from, uh, from your different perspectives? Maybe this time we go first Larissa or uh, first Larissa and then Lucas. Sure. So I'll, I'll address the question about NATO helping allies uh, first. Um, so I think I think one of the the most valuable things that NATO can provide is a platform. It can you know it can convene discussions and bring allies together to exchange best practices to share information. Um, I mean, we talk so much about um, the importance of situational awareness and being able to identify disinformation. We're in this space right now where, um, you know, I, I was looking at one of the questions in the chat, which was like, which was, what is the level of disinformation coming from Russia? That is such a big question. And what we've realized in the community is that um, there's so much more nuance than we thought, you know, we need to be able to collectively have a common framework to, uh, you know, collect evidence in a systematic way, in the same way, so that we're, we're comparing apples with apples when we're you know, looking at disinformation. So I just think that the platform that NATO can provide for allies to come to the table and share information and to make sure that we have that collective approach, I think is, is, <clears throat> I think is invaluable. Um, and I'd, I'd say also another, um, another way that we help allies, of course, is you know, we have uh, our, our little, resilience uh, grant program, um, which obviously you know about. But you know, of course, a lot of that is about supporting grassroots level initiatives that come from um, allied countries and being able to support them and um, make sure that um, you know civil society can continue pioneering um, important initiatives, whether it's media literacy or whether it's research or whatever it is. So I think, um, yeah, those are some of the ways that that we're that we're working with allies. Uh, then we're gonna go back to come back to you for the trends of tomorrow. Okay, so Lucas, tomorrow's okay. trend. So uh, bring us into the future. Um, I, I sort of touched upon it. Like there, you can never predict the future. But for me, the the trend that I'm worried about the most this is uh, AI. The use of AI, right? Because now a lot of the troll accounts, the bot accounts, are require a lot of uh, time to to be made to look believable, right? But imagine if you can develop an AI to be able to spread fake messages that are generated by AI on any given topic, which we will come at that point when you will be chatting with a, I don't know, with a Twitter account and you will have no idea if it's AI or, or a real person. And imagine multiply it by hundreds and thousands and so on and so on. So I'm not sure how uh, social media platforms will have to deal with it because they're not doing the, the greatest job at the moment even, but uh, this will be the whole next step when, uh, when even for, you know, for debunkers, for actual real people, it will be hard to say uh, whether or not we're talking with a algorithm or, or with a human being. Oh, that's a very bleak uh, prospect there. Um, and let's hope that in the meantime, we will also develop an artificial intelligence and be able to counter uh, these. Um, Larissa, back to you uh, for the future trends observed from, uh, from your NATO perspective. I mean, this sounds like such a vanilla response, but I have to agree with Lucas, <laughs> um, you know, because we've seen how deep fakes have become more and more sophisticated. Um, and I think there is a genuine concern at how quickly this technology is accelerating and what that will mean. Um, 
you know, when we think about how much, um, you know, disinformation just in an article can impact people, um, you know, if people aren't checking sources, um, if they're not looking at the tone of the article, um, you know, if they're not, you know, checking their biases, um, just, you know, imagine what happens when you get a video, which just seems so real. Um, so, you know, I, I, I totally agree. I think that is, that is going to be a problem. Um, so. so, so artificial intelligence and deep fakes. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah. Although, although, although like with deep, with these deep fakes and i don't know if you guys agree and then we'll move on to the last questions and, and stuff but with the deep fakes we have been hearing a lot about these and still it's not happening much there is not much happening around am i correct yeah i guess you're not seeing well from my perspective i guess you're not seeing that many um but even even you know like artificially created um you know profile pictures and things like that you know like i think the average person doesn't inspect <laughs> the the image on a on a social media account for example um you know i'll hand it over to lucas yeah I, would, I will just add that uh in my view deepfakes are sort of part of ai they're computer generated so they're sort of in the same direction but uh yeah i uh, completely agree with larissa the main struggles we have now is that uh, these uh fake profile pictures that are being generated some of them are actually really really hard to uh to you know to identify uh the only reason that we are able to identify usually is that uh AI does not generate more than one at the moment. Well, at least it's not very easy to generate. We'll have to put more effort to generate more more than one. And if you see an account with only one picture and all of the rest are, you know, not the pictures of the same person, then you sort of can can uh, can guess that maybe it's auto generated. Uh, but yeah, we're moving in the in a direction where uh, they are generated by the second, and you can't really tell if it's a human or or not. Thank you, Lucas. So uh, if there are not any uh, questions from the audience, I will ask the last two questions uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll conclude the event. But I don't see any, uh, I don't see any raised uh, hand. So um, one of the first questions that was asked in the chat was about um, Russian disinformation in the Ukrainian context and Russian uh, election meddling um, efforts through uh, this information means. Um, and I'm, it got me thinking, because like also what we are seeing today with, with Belarus, it's always like this information campaigns that go and target, that go and build a different narrative. And a narrative that kind of, uh, you know, is not, uh, is, is well done in a sense, in the sense that it target specifically certain fragilities in the Western world. So my question would be, do you think that as part of the measures that we have to put in place to protect the West from, uh, from, uh, from the threat coming from this information is also to build a new uh, Western narrative. And this is something similar to what, to what maybe NATO is doing with the We Are NATO uh, campaign. So what do you think about this? Maybe uh, Larissa and then Lucas. Uh, so if I understand correctly, um, so should should the West be putting out uh, new narratives about the West to protect people from disinformation? Yeah. Substantially, what I'm arguing is that all the disinformation campaign, they do target us in, in soft spots. And the soft spots are where our way of talking about ourselves is not working. So like fragilities that we have, fragilities in the way the European Union works when it comes about uh, uh, managing uh, uh, migration, fragilities uh, about uh, how decisive and relevant relevant NATO uh, is today, and they go and they target at exactly there. So what I was I was wondering is, do you think we need to develop a stronger message, a stronger narrative about who we are, what we stand for, what we fight for, in order to be more resilient to these kind of threats? Now, am, did I make myself clear? Yeah. Um... And I'm, I'll, yeah, so I mean, just a really quick response is, you know, I think that the narratives are there. Uh, I think we just need to say them louder. Um, and I think, you know, 
you know, the We Are NATO campaign is like a nice example of, you know, how we go out there and spread the word about, about the alliance and the benefits that it, that it provides for uh, ordinary citizens. Um, and I think, you know, if, you know, if all allies actually, you know, took part in the campaign and, and communicated to their audiences, then, um, then of course that would, um, I think that would definitely build resilience against disinformation. Thanks. Thank you, Larissa. Lucas. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I, uh, that's something that keeps me awake at night as well. <laughs> um, I do believe I, we've been talking like uh, as a, as, as I'm working in this field for, for five, six years, I've been talking about it a whole lot. Positive narratives uh, are key in battling this information. And uh, a good example that I like to give is, uh, and I'm sure there's many more, but in Lithuania, uh, we identified uh, that one of our sort of Achilles heels uh, that Russia is targeting is our history. And uh, they're sort of touching up on very specific events and trying to, you know, poke it and say, oh, maybe it was, you know, maybe actually not only Nazis were killing the Jews, maybe you're also involved and so on and so on. So positive uh, narratives that um, I think this is the, the job of any stratcom organization in the country is to sort of very clearly translate the message, not only uh, to the society saying that this is these are the facts this is how we go this is our official position but also to our allies because this is also important because on these specific issues on ukraine uh, anything else uh, historical issues uh, people who are maybe not as involved in the historic history of specific countries can be easily tricked and deceived by china russia and so on so these are i think this is a, a key thing to, to say those positive narratives loud and clear Thank you guys and this is also why we we have these projects with nato and, and we do this kind of events to encourage like young people in engaging and and contribute in spreading like a positive narrative about uh what the west does and what the what the alliance does um last question for for both of you and then um uh, and then uh, we will uh we'll say farewell and uh I'll, I'll leave everybody to their exciting uh friday night um do you guys have any tips on how young people uh, or not so young people can spot or stop the spread of disinformation. Uh, maybe this time we go Lucas and then Larissa. Yeah, well, it's it's really hard to to answer this very in short in short manner. But I would say uh, media literacy is great. Uh, sort of having the basics of how to operate online is is really really good. And uh, we are doing a lot of educational work, and uh, I think I think this is the key, right? So to like to know the basics, you only need a few hours to sort of know how to I don't know how to check the sources, how to check if the image is photoshopped, how to check if you know how the reverse image search works, and so on, so on. So the basics of uh, open source and media literacy, I think, does wonders, and I'm very happy that more and more. Uh, countries are putting this as part of the uh, school curriculum. And I think in the, in the future, the problem would be, uh, will be uh, not as, not as uh, big as we have it now. Thank you, Lucas. Larissa? Yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's all about media literacy. Um, I'd say, yeah, check the source. Um, obviously to see if it's credible, check the story to see if the facts are accurate and if other people are reporting on it. The tone, um, because of course uh, we we know that disinformation usually tries to trigger people emotionally. Um, yeah, I think those would be the the top tips. But I completely agree that there's always going to be disinformation, and obviously we talked about you know uh, AI and stuff, so it's not going to get easier. So it's it's about making sure that that people can think critically um, when they come across these uh, these types of threats. Thanks. Fantastic. And uh, I'd like to add that uh, both, uh, both, NATO, both NATO has some interesting source on, uh, on their websites uh, when it comes about uh, giving, um, giving directions in how to deal with these, uh, with this phenomena. And um, the same goes also for the, um, the Digital Forensic Lab uh, and uh, the, uh, the Civic Resilience Initiative. Uh, so if you guys gonna want to snoop around a bit, you're gonna find everything that you need out there. And this is what we were talking about in the beginning. It's a bit of OSINT. Um, 
And another source that I would recommend, of course, is uh, Bellingcat. Uh, they have a specific toolkit that you can uh, that you can consult uh, online and for free. And uh, but of course, uh, like we will continue with this kind of projects, and uh, in the next uh, in the next phases, uh, we'll try to to actually bring you some real media uh, literacy. Um, Enhancing tools uh, so that we can uh, we can build uh, who knows maybe a even a better society by fighting uh, disinformation and uh, and the, the the effects the negative effects that comes with it. Uh, okay, so let me thank again our speakers. Um, I don't know you, but from my perspective, it's always good to uh, to talk to young people with young people among their speakers and um and it, it's fantastic that young people they you know they reach certain uh, certain uh, positions and they and they still are happy and able and engaged to give back their knowledge and uh, expand what they know and uh, spread uh, spread the message so thank you guys for this i really appreciate it and um and it was lovely to meet you and I hope all the other people found this event very nice. And as you know, this event has been uh, recorded and the recording will be then sent to all the students involved in the, in the political training school of the De Gasperi Foundation. And it will be stored also in our archives so that you can consult it every time you want in case you missed something that we said today. Uh, if Larissa and Lucas, uh, you can stay with me five minutes more, uh, we're going to uh, close the event, but you stay so we have a, a little moment uh, among ourselves. Uh, thank you, everyone, again.